Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to uh, say a few words uh, regarding the Minister of Justice as a former minister. Initially, I heard the Honorable Sumandaran in the morning took a few pot shots at the Honorable Minister, saying that he threatened to resign and didn't resign. And I would rather say, I would not be so uncharitable to the Honorable Minister. He would rather stay there and fight it out rather than resign him because if you ask me as somebody who had resigned previously uh, thrice over, I would rather say that it is better to stay and fight than to tender a resignation. Uh, of course, the indignation that he suffered has been corrected perhaps to some extent, but then the way in which uh, this particular uh, presidential commission is going around with pomp and pageantry all over and are being received by uh, some, it is very surprising to all of us because now we see that this country's criminal justice system is facing many challenges. Now, not only that uh, those people who are chairing such commissions have been convicted earlier for having, for the offense of uh, contempt of court, they have also been pardoned by presidential pardon. They have, this issue has been taken up many a time, but be that as it may, it is important for us to now look at the manner in which certain pieces of legislation is being the, because it's, it's seen as most damaging uh, mechanism by which minorities have been targeted by weaponizing the specific pieces of legislation to decide to detain and silence individuals. Now I'm specifically saying about the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Both have been combined and been used to take revenge against minorities and important individuals. Now I would like to refer to this particular case of uh, Mr. Azad Sali. Now this particular case, now um, I would like to quote uh, a column written by uh, Mr. Javid Yusuf uh, in the Sunday Times. He normally writes this column on, uh, particularly on legal matters. He had been a former member of the Constitutional Council. He says this, the Chief Magistrate had delivered an order drawing attention to a strong discrepancy between the views expressed by Azad Sali during the media conference, which was at the heart of the indictment against him, and the content of the edited version published by the media. It was on the edited version that the indictment against Mr. Sali had been based. Chief Magistrate had observed that if the entire unedited version of the media conference had been published, it would have been clear that the suspect had expressed an idea of building peace among the people and to rise up as one nation. This column pointed out that if the findings of the Chief Magistrate were upheld, it would be an uphill task to establish a prosecution's case against Adar Sali. This column also urged that in view of the order by the Colombo Chief Magistrate, it was incumbent on the Attorney General to review the indictment against Mr. Sali and take appropriate action. What happened? The Attorney General didn't pay any heed to the comments made by the Chief Magistrate, went ahead with the indictment, didn't withdraw the indictment, went ahead with the uh, case. And I made it a point to be present in court on two days in order to just give some moral support to Mr. Azad Sali for what had happened, the way in which he was being victimized. And finally, um, we, were, uh, we were pleased to see that the uh, learned uh, High Court judge had uh, uh, acquitted him from all charges and have also found fault with three of our members of parliament who had made a very damaging false uh, representation to the police in order to say that he had engaged in hate speech. Now this is how the ICCPR provisions and the PTA had been combined in order to refuse bail for him. For nine months yet to be uh, in uh, without uh, uh, any, any bail in, in custody. And this is a very, very serious matter. I'm sure the, I'm, I'm, and the High Court judge has now summoned these members of parliament in order to see whether some damages could be awarded. That be that as it may, now this has become a common practice. Now we see, uh, now our Attorney General's department has a very, very important function in the country. I mean, the Attorney General being the chief law officer, he is a main advisor to the government. But be that as it may, he's also, uh, he also has to oversee the criminal justice system that the, all the prosecutorial functions regarding criminal matters comes under him. Now, there seems to be some confusion sometimes. This uh, 
particularly when it comes to the independence of the Attorney General. Now we see a very important judgment recently by the Supreme Court. This is a yes. Now I would like to read from a recent judgment by uh, Justice uh, uh, Janak de Silva. Uh, in this case, very, very clearly he says this. He quotes uh, uh, Lord Denning and says, uh, particularly this, the Attorney General is vested with extensive statutory powers in relation to criminal investigations and prosecutions. Such powers are held in public trust they must be exercised for the due administration of justice according to the rule of law, which is the basis of our constitution. Any type of dictation from whatever quarter will compromise the independence of the Attorney General unless such, direct, uh, such dictation is permitted by law. Any compromise of the independence of the Attorney General will have negative impact on the rule of law. This is regarding a cabinet decision which forced uh, the Attorney General to withdraw uh, indictment against several people who had been having domesticated elephants. But be that as it may, now in some parts of the Commonwealth we have the Attorney General as a member of the Cabinet himself. But here it is not so. But still, this type of uh, uh, serious matters, particularly when it comes to criminal matters, it would be rather advisable to create a separate directorate of public prosecutions rather than to, because this appears to be, yeah, to be undue pressure. Pressure. Yes, undue pressure on the Attorney General. I know with the limited time, there's hardly anything to say. Similarly, matters, uh, several, uh, we, are, we are very pleased, at least now that we see some activism from the judiciary regarding matters where fabricated evidence is being used to keep people in custody. Yesterday, we saw in the papers today that Ahanaf Jazim, a poet who had been held in custody for several um, months now, almost a year or more, uh, under the PTA as well as the ICCPR, similar manner. Now, uh, Attorney General has consented perhaps to uh, give him bail, but similarly, there is this case of Hijaz Hizbullah, there's another case. These are matters of serious matter. This has already been raised by the European Commission and in, the, in regard to the GSP plus matters, there, are, uh, there, there is also a, uh, the report by the High Commissioner for Human Rights. These matters have been raised even there. So therefore, it is important for the Attorney General to realize the dangers of fabricating evidence and to look at uh, the veracity of evidence available for him to uh, carry on uh, with a case, otherwise to withdraw the indictment. Whereas he is uh, seeking to withdraw indictments where there are some uh, politically interested parties. Rather than that, he will to bear and to take action accordingly. Thank you.